Good evening, campers, streamers, and babysitters, and welcome to our raw reaction review of the Outwaters. <laughs> Nine one one. What are you reporting? Can you hear me? And we just want to start off by thanking the folks over at Screenbox for providing us with this screener to check out the Outwaters a few days early. Yes, this is coming to you folks on the ninth, and uh, we got to see it. And uh, yeah, Luke, how are we feeling about this uh, unique film? Uh, let me tell you, getting the screener. What a treat it was, because as we've talked about it before, I don't know if we've ever actually mentioned it um, on the podcast or anything, because it's never really arose, I don't think, because we don't haven't really covered a lot of found footage things. Um, found footage isn't really my thing for the most part. You know, I think um, obviously you have the Blair Witch is a big one and then um, paranormal activity. You know, you have a lot of different things, but for most of the time, I stay away from it. So knowing that the Outwaters was kind of a found footage film, I wasn't sure what to think here, but I'm going to say like all the twists and turns in this film, you would have never guessed where this was going. And overall, I was extremely impressed with this overall. That was great. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I am not a huge uh, found footage fan. Uh, I really can only cite Blair Witch and um, the Cloverfield film, the first one, yeah, uh, as being like big influences for me as a kid. And then, you know, there have been uh, some decent ones um like willow creek i know is an inspiration towards this movie um and why it was made found footage so it's one of those things where it's like that's a great one other than that i i can think of a lot of mockumentaries and things like that that i enjoy that i watch but do you really count those as found footage yeah and that's where it's like i think you kind of get in this weird area because even like for me the original cloverfield i struggled with because i wasn't a big found footage person so um, already going into a lot of these uh, these subgenre films, th they almost have a strike against them. So even diving into the Outwaters, I was a little hesitant about it because I wasn't really sure what we were going to get here, how well it was going to be done. Um, but, you know, it, it's like um, he made a film that, you know, used the budget wisely, I think. And it made it feel, it, there's so much quality in this film that you'll never guess that it is, you know, for a smaller budget. No, I agree. Yeah, I definitely think that he gets away with a ton uh, yeah. behind the cameras here, which is kind of honestly impressive. Um, I think that, you know, just like a film we talked about last month um, that started off the month was uh, Skin of a Rink. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was a lot of theater of the mind. This film, although I think is a little easier to follow than Skin and Marink, uh, I guess a little bit more consumable, I would say, to like a, a broader audience as to where Skin and Marink, I think we've kind of seen that when you get a little too far out into the mainstream, people are kind of like, oh my God, that's not for me. Yeah. Whereas the found footage, people are more used to that. So I think it's at least a little bit of an easier pill to swallow. But yeah, this thing is exceptional. I, I think that this is really um, a lot of really broad ideas a lot of really great concepts and again we talked about this uh, i think immediately after seeing the film like once we both watched it um was that we did not expect where this movie goes and you know it, it really pitches itself not really even pitches itself but like early on you think you know where it's going as far as like i think the comparison was hills have eyes yeah and then it's like no this is a totally different beast entirely. And I, I was floored by what we got because it's just so unique and so up my alley. And that's where it's like, you know, going into these films, this subgenre here, and you look at something like the Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think everyone's probably going to bring it up as some sort of comparison here where, you know, that film was such a big deal for the time that it came out that it really estab established a subgenre that, not a there wasn't a lot in, in that subgenre to begin with and now it's kind mm -hmm. of like i think going into it you're always worried that it's going to fall in the same tropes that a lot of the other found footage films do um so again that was my hesitation going in is this going to be unique is it you know going to be something that after the credit roll it's going to be stuck in your head and this is easily a film that the more you sit with it um i think the more you enjoy it because mm -hmm. you start asking yourself questions and 
like Skinnamarink, um, this film was made also to kind of have you experience it and have that abstract idea of what do you want to take out of this film? And that's why I think this film works so well. And, you know, using the found footage um, to the fullest extent, I think, you know, where um, he's behind the camera, um, you know, gives us a reason as to why this is found footage. And um, I think he uses it to build the tension perfectly. Um, even the, the, the audio from the, <laughs> the guy controlling the camera I think is perfect, especially in those dark scenes, because there are some scenes in here where it's almost pitch black. Um, and I think that really builds the tension to it. Um, and again, the audio in this is something I, I'll compare it again to Skin and Marink, where it's like, I think the audio here gets the most mileage just because it, it's, you know, let's watching this with headphones in. I think it really beats into your head and really builds that tension. Yeah, they, I, I agree that the audio was uh, huge in the uh, creation of making this so, you know, it, it sold it really well, I guess is the best way to put it. It's like it, it helped sell this movie um, in a lot of scenes where it really did feel like it had a much bigger scale going into the production than, um, you know, what it actually turns out to be. So it's one of those things where it's like it really felt like they used a lot of simple tricks and they used a lot of really cool, um, you know, to try to dance around kind of spoilers here. They use a lot of cool concepts and simple tricks to go a long way in the filmmaking of this. And I think, you know, I compared this in a few different ways to evil dead, which the first one, and it's, it's so not that, so don't go in expecting that. Okay yeah. guys. But like I compare this um, in a sense, tonally to the making of, like um evil dead you know what i mean as to where you know we we kind of have these ragtag group of people or at least this one person who has an idea they go out to the backwoods of their home uh town or where they're living at the moment and they just make a fucking movie and it comes out this impactful and this creepy i mean that's a fucking win in my book like yeah. that's it's it's truly I know I'm speaking high praises and I spoke high praises of Skin and Marink, but these are two very unique films. And this one, especially, um, I don't want to spoil it by saying what exactly it leans into, but it is a subgenre of mine that I absolutely adore and I did not expect it. And that's where, you know, as Dylan just said, we're <laughs> kind of dancing around spoilers here, so we don't want to give tough. really <laughs> anything away. Uh, but they almost take um, an established subgenre as found footage and they meld it into a different subgenre of exactly. horror, you know, and it's done uh, seamlessly. It, it like works to perfection. And again, I think melding the found footage with this other subgenre is perfect because I don't think, and again, I'm, I'm not a big found footage person, but I don't really yeah. recall this kind of marriage between, uh, two different subgenres like this, at least this well. And I think it, it just works. It's, it's um, the imagery that he uses. Um, there's a couple effects in here that, you know, uh, once you see the film, you'll easily know what we're talking about, that uh, otherworldly things. Um, and again, the, the lighting or lack of lighting that he uses in a lot of the scenes really adds to um, the the off-putting of, you know, some of the, the close-ups that you get of these otherworldly things, these beings and things. Um, it's very intriguing, I think. Um, it's one of those things where, as I said, the Blair Witch Project was something that, you know, nationally just became such a big thing um, pop culture-wise. Now, The Outwaters is going to be released on such, a, you know, a smaller scale, but I think like looking at this film for a lot of filmmakers, I, I think this one's going to, you know, live on for the next few years as something where you can almost model um, something that doesn't cost a lot. And you can still really get an intriguing story when you use the audio, when you use the visuals to its fullest extent. I agree, man. I, I was really impressed by this. Um, I know that I think we can kind of talk about the meta too of, a lot of people on Twitter and other social media is comparing these two films as far as this and Skin and Marink. Yeah. They're great cousin films because these are two unique horror films uh, released in such quick succession to each other that both really have a really big ideas and they're not holding the audience's hand. And I think that's some of the biggest praise I can give these two filmmakers and especially here to uh, 
Robbie Banfitch, who took the found footage subgenre, which, you know, we've all spoken about it. It has a lot of great films, but then there's a whole slew of just, you can find them on Tubi or anywhere of just really poor excuses to use it. It's just kind of like, yeah, it's cheap. We can get away with it, but they don't use it as creatively as they do. In yeah. Stuff. They don't apply the extra mileage to, to really get to the heights that this movie gets. And I seriously think that this is going to be a found footage classic. Uh, I'm, I'm putting that out there now, but I think this is going to appeal to a lot of people. I think so too. Um, I'm intrigued for, uh, a lot of people to see this. I know there is mm -hmm. kind of a buzz around it right now, especially follow following so close with Skinner Marink and, you know, with a lot of these young up and coming filmmakers here, trying something different, something a little more abstract, you know, um, I'm absolutely pleased with this because, you know, there, there's going to be not a clear message. I think out of this film, you're really going to take what you want from this and no one's going to be wrong, you know, and maybe no one's necessarily going to be right. You know, it's, it's going to be one of those things where you can toss around in your head for, for a long time and still not be any closer to an answer. And this is something that I absolutely love where it's like, again, not hand, you're not doing the hand holding thing. You're letting someone just experience the film. And this doesn't fall into the norm of found footage where those ones, you know, you get the, the basic tropes and it gets really hard to build that tension for um, Robbie Banfitch really, it built a lot of tension in this film and it's like everything feels so natural. The characters feel natural. The dialogue feels natural. I love the editing choices that he's done here. It really flows up until we kind of get to the trigger of this film and it kind of yeah. really turns it as to what this film's really going to be about. And, you know, I think that's a big thing where if you're not resonating with those characters right out of the gate, you're not going to care for the last half of this film. But here I think uh, everyone's likable. I mean, we dive into some backstories and some relationships here. And, you know, I, though the way kind of he segments this uh, in between three se separate parts, um, I think is very intriguing as well. He's bringing something mm -hmm. new and something different almost, you know, um, that we've seen over the past few years. He's bringing it all into uh, a film like The Outwaters. And I think this is going to be a film that inspires a lot of other up and coming filmmakers. I agree with you. I really think that this is something that, if you're a casual horror fan, but especially if you're a horror fan who wants to be a filmmaker, you got to see this movie. You know, you got to see Skin and Marink. You got to see this because I think that if you're a film lover, if you're a, a horror film lover and you have that passion in you, like this is a must watch. If you're a casual horror fan, again, this is a must watch. I think that this is definitely going to break new ground for a lot of people uh, when it comes to the found footage genre. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy the different take here and the risk and bringing this to the screen. I think there's a lot of stuff. I could see this going many different ways, but I, I think that this is something that uh, a lot of people are going to need to check out. And we saw a screener, but I would love to see this in a theater. I absolutely. would absolutely. Cause that, again, that sound design that we talked about towards the beginning of the review, it's so impactful. And that's not to say that the imagery isn't because it's shot beautifully. And to, you know, kind of have a little inside knowledge on how it was shot, it's kind of mind blowing because yeah. it's like this is equipment that we've worked with and the shots they got out of it. It's just like the dude's got an eye. And again, I highly recommend the Outwaters. Yeah, uh, the Outwaters, again, it, it has a really strong narrative tie to it. So going into it, um, you can expect that it's not going to be, you know, I think the message is abstract in terms of when you leave the theater, but um, you know, you'll, it's got a, a follow line. So it's, you know, mm. you're not going to be lost. It's got a good it, hook. Yes. It, it's going to allow you to lose yourself in the story and, um, not feel like, you know, you're an outsider looking in trying to figure out what exactly is going on. You're going to be able to stick with it. Um, again, the tension here is great. Um, the usage of the low lighting in some instances, I think works perfectly. And then mm -hmm. when he focuses on certain images, in in that low light i think again is, is something where it takes a great filmmaker to do that and like dylan said we have you know to have some inside knowledge of what was used here it's easily accessible equipment and once you know what he used it's like boy he's really getting the most out of that equipment as well because this feels so cinematic um odd oddly visually i mean it, it's really something that is very well done 
Um, you know, we watched the screener. I am very eager to check this one out again. I hope this gets a physical release so that I can watch oh, it. It will. He, he's already confirmed that it will. Um, uh, several times, you know, because, again, this is something that I think a lot of people can use as a blueprint to say, you know, um, Robbie Banfinch didn't have the biggest budget, and he went out here and made it made something really well, well done. So it's like now I can go out here and do this because I know uh, both Dylan and I were inspired by this film. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 eye opening. And uh, I got to say, a part of that has to do with the fact that uh, along with the screener uh, Screenbox did provide us and, uh, you know, the gentleman himself with not only uh, the opportunity, but his time to sit down and speak with the director of the Outwaters, Robbie Banfitch. And uh, in which case, I have a small clip for you, which I'm going to play right now. So, like, did you initially go out with a camera and were like, let's see what's out here and what I can put into this film and then and then kind of get a better idea of what kind of laying that groundwork and then going back out multiple times? Or was it pretty much you already kind of had that plan of I already know what's out here and this is definitely going to be in the film and then kind of occasionally seeing extra things to end there, up later being in the film? There was definitely an initial plan and I knew everything that I needed to get for the initial way I wanted the story to be um but once we did and we did like one big shoot but then once I put that all together I, I like oh wow this would be cool or this is an interesting idea and it's just so easy to drive out there and do a scene for like a few hours that I just kind of kept going to the desert until it felt like the film was right yeah, so you guys can catch the full interview with director Robbie Banfitch on uh, the 9th, which is the same day that The Outwaters comes out. So February 9th, we'll be posting the full interview. Um, there will is a warning. There is a, a few spoilers that we discuss. You know, they're not anything major, but, uh, you know, there are definitely things I think in this movie, it's best to go in completely blind. Yeah, because I think like it, it will hit you a lot harder. Um, so I just want to preface that and just say, hey. There's some spoilers. So make sure you check out the Outwaters in theaters on February 9th and then to follow up on Screenbox uh, in a couple months down the road. Yeah, um, I don't think you're going to be disappointed at all. I do. I strongly encourage. I don't know where this is being released. I know people have been kind of keeping updated on, on Twitter and everything as to uh, some showings and things. If this isn't near you, I would strongly recommend going out of your way to see this film um I, it's so well done it, it's going to be something that i think you can watch over and over again um it, it's just i can't speak highly enough of it you know it, it's got a great narrative um he had a great handle in the tone that he wanted here as well um and the interview uh the interview was great as well um make sure you check that out i'm not just saying that because it's on our channel but uh, it was very interesting to kind of pick his brain and kind of get his thought pre process behind a lot of things especially we do dive into some of the actual filmmaking and uh, what he was thinking about, about certain scenes and things like that. So definitely check this out and then, you know, stick around for our interview. Absolutely. Lots of fun stuff coming to the channel. Thank you guys for checking out this review. As always, if you are new here and you just discovered us, please hit that subscribe button. We are on our, on our way to a thousand subscribers. We're hoping to get there before May, which would be our year anniversary. So if we can make that happen, that'd be pretty cool. Other than that, of course, again, as I said in the review, check out The Outwaters on February 9th in theaters. Just look it up. See if it's near you. You can check on Fandango. Uh, they also have links in their Twitter. Um, and then also, you know, go ahead and check out the service stream box. They generously provided this for us, of course. So we got the opportunity to do this early. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully we can do a few more in the future for you guys. Because, yeah, this was a lot of fun. And uh, it's always nice to kind of get ahead of these things and you know, be able to get your opinion out there and try to get people to see something, especially when it's this damn unique. Yes, absolutely. It's something that, um, like I said, you have to go check out, go out of your way to see it. Mm -hmm. All righty. But I guess that's all we got for you today. So uh, until next time, I'm Dylan Newell. And I'm Luke Janesco. And remember, stay scared. <laughs>